Okay. Huh. I tell you, it is, you have to get a lot more things ready when, uh, 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 when you're trying to offer the uh, triple offering of, uh, uh, of the uh, class. How many students do we have in this class? There are five. Oh, wow. I know, you're surprised it's so large. I know, I barely made it here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, Michelle is here, Judith is here, it, has anyone heard from uh, Rebecca? I haven't heard anything. We just drank the whole time. Oh man, I should have been here. <laughs> you should have already told me what you were going to do. Ah, okay. Who have we got? Oh, okay. Both those participants up are me. Uh, and uh, you're uh, uh, Thailand in the back, right? Am I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Astonishingly enough. All right, so the only one we're missing is our actual en engineering student. All right, um, so, so far we've talked about how a company organizes around projects and about culture. Um, another important, well, I'd like to think a lot of what we talk about in this class is important. But something we haven't talked about is defining the project. All right, so when we define the project, the first thing we're going to have to do is define the project scope. And that means how wide, how wide is our project going to be? Uh, right? If we say, you know what, we want to improve the roads in the Navajo Nation, that's our project. Well, does that mean that we're going to attack all the roads in the Navajo Nation? Does it mean we're going to attack uh, doing the roads in the Eastern Agency? Does it mean that we're going to attack the roads uh, uh, just here in Crown Point? Or does it mean that we're just going to do my street, which is made of dirt, and every time it rains, it has a new set of holes? <laughs> which I find annoying, but I don't know if that's enough to organize uh, a, a giant project around. Although it would be expensive to pave the road. Um, right, so we have to know what is the scope of the project. How wide are we casting our net as far as what are we going to do within this project. And all right, so when we talk about defining the project, we talk about our 
uh, project scope, right? We are going to have a definition of what is the end result or the mission of our project. Is it a product or service for the client or customer? And we have to describe that in specific, tangible, and measurable terms, right? In other words, our project scope can never say something like, oh, we just want to make things better. Okay, well, we want to make things better, great. Uh, uh, a noble aspiration. How do we want to make them better? Uh, All right, so our project scope statement, we're going to very clearly say what are the deliverables for the end user, uh, right? Again, we don't want any squishiness where later on they can come back and they say, well, I don't think you really met this deliverable, right? We want it to be defined very well so that uh, it feels like we have uh, 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 we know exactly what we're trying to do so that we can do that. We're focusing our project on the successful completion of these goals, these deliverables, uh, making a product or a service, uh, uh, whatever it is, and uh, if we have kind of a fuzzy goal in the first place, we're not likely to achieve anything that's very useful. So, when we, uh, when we do this, the deliverables, the goals, however we want to uh, talk about them, we're going to use those as a planning tool and something that we can measure the success of our project against. Um, as I've told you all before, probably to the point where you're bored to death with me saying so, I've done many, many projects. And I have had some that were hugely successful we way overproduced compared to what we were thought we would do. And I've had ones that have been abject failures. Um, we can learn from both. Uh, uh, although, unfortunately, it seems like we learn more from failure than from success. All right, so when we're putting together our project scope, First of all, we have to have a clear idea of what is our objective. Okay, so let's say we're going to create a project to get vaccinations for the children of the Navajo Nation. Okay, well, how many? Uh, uh, you know, again, it becomes a thing of, all right, am I doing my neighborhood? Am I doing Crown Point? Am I doing the Eastern Agency? Am I covering the whole Navajo Nation? What is the number of children vaccinated that we can sit back and say, you know what, we've done something good. We may not have gotten everyone, but we still did something good. What are the deliverables um, that we are going to bring uh, to the customer or to the people we serve with the project, uh, right? If we do vaccinations for the children of the Navajo Nation and all we're able to get them is chickenpox vaccinations, well, is that going to be the deliverable we're worried about? In some instances, that might be what we want to do you know we're just we're very worried about the incidence of chickenpox um, uh, but we might say no we want to do chickenpox we also want to do measles mumps rubella 
uh, uh, other, uh, other diseases. What are the milestones? In other words, what are our markers when we say we've had this much success? Right? If we get uh, what, um, if we get a uh, tenth of the children on the Navajo Nation vaccinated, that could be a milestone. Right? Um, and we might measure everything from there. Right? It might be a tenth of the uh, children. It might be 20% of the children, uh, half the children. What, you know, those might be our, our milestones. Or if we're doing a road building project, we might say if we get this many miles of road built, that's our first milestone. And then if we get this many more built, that's our second milestone, and so on. What are the technical requirements that are needed within this, right? If we're talking about a vaccination uh, project, well, we can't just get a bunch of vaccina uh, a vaccine and run out there with a bunch of needles and vaccine chasing children down in the street. Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be legal or, uh, uh, or good medical practice, right? We would have to set up the technical requirements. Okay, we get these vaccines. They have to have refrigeration. We have to have qualified people on site to administer the vaccinations and to be able to react uh, to be uh, able to swing into action if people react to the vaccine. And what are the limits and the exclusions, right? If we're going to vaccinate the children, are there some children we're not going to vaccinate for whatever reason? They're, pe they're children with known health problems and issues. Maybe we're not going to vaccinate them. Uh, their, uh, uh, their parents uh, are Jehovah's Witnesses or some other religion that doesn't allow vaccines. Well, seems to me like that's an exclusion right there. Uh, and we want to make sure that our customers are happy. Uh, when we do a project, if you walk away and the customer is unhappy, that's not a good feeling for anyone. Uh, so we want to make sure that the customers are happy, or at least mostly happy, because there's always somebody that has an issue. Uh, and it may be an issue that just can't be resolved uh, reasonably. All right, so usually when we talk about the uh, pr uh, project scope, we have a scope statement that we usually call the, the statement of work or the SAO. Um, we really do call it the SAO at times. Um, and um, uh, so we have that, and again, our scope statement is kind of our guide, guiding star. We have to make sure that we put everything in our scope statement while still keeping it as short as possible, right? We want our scope statement to be something people can read and understand exactly what our project is about but we don't want it to be so long that they fall asleep in the middle. Uh, all right. A lot of times we'll do a project charter, which tends to be a, a larger version of the scope statement. Uh, right? In the scope statement, if we're doing our vaccine project, we may say, 
uh, keeping with all applicable medical standards. But in the charter, we expand that out. Hey, we will have uh, doctors who are overseeing this. We will have proper facilities for uh, preserving the vaccines. We will have proper medical personnel to administer the vaccines and make sure there are no uh, problems. All right. We often think of this as authorizing our project manager to go ahead and start the project and lead the project. Scope creep is one of the most feared problems among project managers. Uh, there's always a tendency when you're the uh, when you're on the project, the customer will come up. Well, could we do this? also uh, right and then you go well uh, I guess we could uh, right and then next week they come well uh, can we also squeeze this in right and the next thing you know you've promised so much that you may not be able to deliver it on time or within budget and staying on time and in budget is extremely important uh, for projects. All right, so our second step is we have to establish our project priorities. Uh, one thing that we're going to hit is something where we have to trade off uh, what is going to happen in the project uh, because uh, maybe we were too ambitious and we're not going to be able to do everything that we thought within the time period we thought or for the amount of money that we have to do it. Uh, so uh, the criterion that we're talking about are almost always cost, time, and performance, right? So uh, when we talk about cost, that means our budget. Uh, a really good project manager uh, brings the project in right around the exact amount of the budget. Uh, I remember uh, one project I managed uh, for uh, Texas A&M, we brought it in within $4.36 uh, of the budget. And this is on a multi-million dollar project. So, oh man, we almost sprained our arms patting ourselves on the back. Uh, is that your general um, goal is to stay within what's projected? Like the money that you asked for or you got awarded for that specific project? Is it in favor or is it like a good, like you said, a good pat on the, the project team's back if you stay within that budget? It's... Um, Staying within budget is uh, pretty important. Um, and it kind of depends where you are. Like, a lot of times, if you're on a government project, they don't care. They just shovel more money in. <laughs> um, right? But in a more private money-making enterprise, um, that's going to be extremely important, right? Because you going over budget means that now we have costs that weren't planned on, weren't accounted for, and we may not be able to cover. Um, in a, a good organization, they're going to be paying attention 
to whether you can bring projects in on time and on budget. Um, if you're in an organization where they're kind of like, well, you're $100,000 over, but who cares? Um, that could be an organization that's not going to last long. Then you won't get your, your compensation that you completed it right away, right? <laughs> well, and, uh, um, well, the thing is, uh, let's say there were five projects in one year. You uh, led one of them, and it was $100,000 over. The other guys, two of them went over a couple of thousand, and the others were under budget. At the end of the year, they have to cut someone. Who are they going to think of first? <laughs> uh, the schedule is very important. Uh, I worked for many years in theater, and uh, opening night is opening night. I mean, the curtain goes up whether the the set is and costumes are finished, the actors are ready to go, no matter what. Uh, now, sometimes in business, industry, government, they'll let they can let the schedule slip. Right, we wanted to have this product by uh, April, April 2nd, but we can let you go till April the 8th, because the unveiling's not till the 10th. Uh, uh, but, I mean, sometimes uh, a schedule is a, is a hard thing, and we cannot let it slip at all. Right, and we're gonna talk about ways of uh, shortening the schedule if we need to, of figuring out a really good budget so that we're, uh, so, that, you know, because look, if they just say, well, how much can you do this for? And you go, um, $110,000. Well, <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a way of estimating. Uh, Right, we're going to want to uh, 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 we're going to want to build that estimate up, and we're going to go through how we do that and ways we can check ourselves on that. So, as the project manager, you would be the one that figures out that whole the whole schedule, the whole budget. Well, it depends on how big a project it is. I've, I've certainly worked projects where, uh, where yeah, I did all the estimates. I, I put down the budget and I said, look, this is going to cost us uh, uh, $12,500. Uh, but uh, the larger a project is, the more help you're going to need figuring that out. Right, if we're talking a multi-million dollar project, you're not just going to pull a number out of the air and say, all right, that's it. No, we're going to spend time working on how much uh, that's going to cost and how long it's going to take. And we also have to worry about our performance, the, the scope that we agree to. Uh, sometimes, uh, we have to let some of the performance slip um, uh, because uh, uh, because our budget, because our time are are getting tight, uh, and and sometimes the customer will even say, "Yeah, that's that's okay," because uh, uh, you know whatever reason. Uh, they, it turns out they needed it sooner, or uh, it turns out they couldn't spend so much money on it. All right, so when we think about our priorities in a project, uh, first of all, we have uh, constraints. 
a constraint is a parameter that is a fixed requirement. Right? So if we're going to build a bridge across a 500 foot gorge, we can't build a, uh, we can't say, well, we can only do 490 feet. Well, bloody hell, that's not going to work. Right? It's got to be the 500 feet. So that's a constraint. It's something that you just can't get around. It has to be that. Uh, sometimes we do what's called a, an enhancement. In other words, we're working along, we're doing pretty good, but the customer comes to us, he says, you know what, we've really identified that this part of the product you're doing for us uh, has to be better. Uh, and, and we have to push more towards making that part of the project uh, better. And, you know, we can kind of let some of this other stuff down a little more. And then there's accepting. Uh, sometimes we can't meet a requirement, uh, uh, either because of budget, because of time, uh, or because of technology. You know, we're trying to invent something brand new and we're having a lot more trouble uh, making it happen than we thought we would. Um, uh, in that case, uh, we may run up against something where we just have to accept, all right, we can do this good in the, in the time and with the money and the technology we have, but we really can't do better. And we just have to accept that. How many times have have you accepted something that just couldn't that just couldn't fit within the project? How does it make you feel? Like I know it's something like you. It's like accepting it, and sometimes accepting things are not as good as it seems to be. Well, I mean, for me personally, I I feel bad. Um, uh, I uh, uh, remember I had to do a project for my father once, uh, and I was I was going to school at the time. I I had this other stuff going on, and um, and so when uh, um, when it was over, uh, I asked him uh, what he thought. And he said, "Well, you did the best you could." With the uh, with the constraints you had, well, of course I felt like crap after he said that. Uh, it's like, Dad, you you couldn't like let me down a little easier. But um, that's always um, look. You can always do better. Uh, it's it's hard to think of anything. Um, that is so perfect that no improvement could be made. Uh, for example, do you know where the word sincere comes from? It comes from the Latin sincera, uh, which means without some stone. When sculptors would make statues, if they made a mistake and they dinged out a little place that it shouldn't be dinged out, they would make a paste with stone to fill that in so it would look like it was perfect. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's rare that everything is so perfect that you just absolutely can't think of anything better that could have been done. So, when we're doing project management, we have the big three here. The scope, the time, and the cost. Uh, and the quality is in the middle. 
Now, a lot of times in uh, engineering, we think of it as you can have low cost and high quality, but it takes more time. Or uh, you can have it fast, but the cost is going to be high and quality, right? So there's always a trade-off between these different elements as far as what is going to happen on a project. Uh, it's, uh, it's rare that the sites are set so low that you just kill all of these categories. And actually a lot of times when that happens, you don't feel that good about the project. You're kind of like, well, you know, a bunch of trained monkeys could have done this well. <laughs> All right, maybe you don't exactly feel like that. But. Right, so here they're, uh, they're doing a, a priority matrix. Um, right, and... Um, and they're saying, look, the performance on this has got to be uh, really good because that is a constraint. One of the things that is, is a real demand for this particular project is the performance has got to be good. Um, the time we're going to enhance, if we can, um, uh, figure out ways of, of collapsing the schedule a bit to make that happen. And we're just going to have to accept uh, uh, what it costs to get that high performance. All right, so step three, we create the work breakdown structure. And what that is, the work breakdown structure is a map of all the tasks identifying what are we going to make, what are the work elements that are involved in a project. Right? So, um, so we have to understand what are all the tasks that uh, uh, and all the, the, the products we're going to need, the products we're going to make, what is the work that's involved, right? So, for example, if we're going to make a house, well, we're going to have to, uh, there's all kinds of things that are going to have to be done in there, um, uh, right? We're going to have to be able to find land, have a design, uh, um, uh, we're going to have to uh, build all the house elements. Um, but we also have to define the relationship uh, of that final uh, deliverable of the project, in this case a house, to all the sub-deliverables and what is their relationship within the work package. Right? So, for example, if we're going to build a house, we don't start with the roof. Uh, right? You can't start with the roof. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing to hold it up. Uh, right? We would have to do things like uh, we'd have to survey the plot of land. We'd ha we have to have a, a design. We have to know how we're going to connect. Um, all the plumbing and into the uh, sewer system and the water system, um, uh, right? Then we, uh, uh, when we've got all the stuff dug out to put the plumbing in, then we're going to start building a foundation, right? Or those two may go along together depending on how they fit together. Right? So we're not going to get to the roof until we've got walls up 
and the other supporting structures that is going to hold the roof up. Uh, and even after we've got the roof, there's going to be a lot of other stuff. So we have to think carefully about what is the relationship between all of these so that we're doing what has to be done first, first, and what has to be done second, second, and so on, all the way up to, um, uh, all the way up to finishing the project. Um, and um, we have an example of this kind of thinking actually right outside this building, butting up against the, uh, what we now call the one-stop shop. You may have noticed there's kind of an ugly gray concrete thing that's half finished. Yeah. Well. That was because an administrator that worked here got a hair up his butt um, and said, damn it, we're going to build this. And he, and he just, he got guys from, uh, uh, from the trades program, uh, students to come over and work on it, but they didn't have any plans. They didn't know how everything was going to fit together. And so now we have the world's ugliest sheep shed. That uh, was supposed to be? Oh no. I was gonna, no, that was supposed it to be did a not start shed. out to be a sheep shed. <laughs> what was it intended for? It was intended to be an extension for the library. Mm, underground? <laughs> I know. Well, that was actually just supposed to be. There's supposed to be that kind of semi half basement part, and then there was supposed to be another short story. But starting the project without having done all this kind of project management stuff first meant they got to a point where they said, uh, We can't do this part that needs to be done now. And the whole project ended up being abandoned. Um, so, um, so, so our work breakdown structure is very well de uh, suited for design and build projects where we have some kind of tangible outcome. Um, we also want to do it if we have a process oriented project such as the vaccine project example I keep bringing up, right? That's more of a process-oriented uh, uh, project, right? Because if it turns out we don't have enough people, uh, we don't have enough equipment, we could get more in the middle of the project, right? But if you get halfway through building the building, as they did on our uh, example outside and discover you've left out some key elements, you're kind of screwed. All right, so um, when we think about the work breakdown uh, structure, it starts here at the very bottom with uh, identifiable work activities, right? So let's use the vaccine project as an example. Okay, so what are some things we would have to do to make that happen? Um, find out the population, of how many kids were aiming to vaccine. vaccine. Exactly. We'd have to identify the demographics. We'd probably have to figure out where they were. How many in the Eastern Agency? How many in the Western Agency? And I don't remember the names of the other agencies. <laughs> uh, I think one of them is the Chin Lee Agency. Central. So we have to know how many children in each place, right? And we'd probably want to break that down further. All right. How many children are there in Crown Point. How many would be associated with Theroux? 
how many would be associated with uh, Little Water or Borrego Pass or a lot of these other uh, and surrounding areas, right. I mean, you're talking, what are we going to do about Rama and Tohajali? They're kind of disconnected and hanging out there. Alamo. <laughs> I don't know Alamo, but I'm assuming it's much the same. Right? Now, what else would we have to and do? And even that, we have to find out which children have been vaccinated and which need the vaccination. Okay, so being able to identify uh, uh, and get their medical records uh, so that we don't vaccinate them twice with something that if you give it to them once, it's good. If you give it to them twice, it's bad. Super good. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would figure out what vaccinations we need. Like, according to CDC, you're supposed to get the chickenpox vaccination by the age three. Or okay, whatever. exactly. We have to think in terms of age, our demographics still, how many are under three and probably still need that uh, chickenpox vaccine? How many are older and they need some other vaccines, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, so what's another uh, example of a work activity we would have to do? Figure out who's going to administer those. those. Exactly. We've got to put together a team, and it can't just be random people off the street <laughs> who are who are kind of using the the uh, the uh, shots like uh, they're playing darts. <laughs> right. So um, now the rest of you guys feel free to pipe up, pipe up here, uh, right? So yeah, there's all kinds of things. We have to identify the, uh, uh, the staff needs. We're going to have to interview people for the staff. Uh, uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to have to, how are we going to get these people to different places? Do we just say, all right, everyone, here's your vaccine bicycle. <laughs> we'll see you in Chamblee in a couple of weeks. Oh, my God. Uh, we have to come up with a schedule and like a mobile or like a big van that has all the vaccine. And it has some of the vaccines have to be refrigerated. Exactly. So there's going to be all kinds of requirements and, and small work activities. Right? So we might be saying, all right, Judith, we need you to talk to the vaccine manufacturers and find out what are the prices for these vaccines, what are the availabilities uh, uh, going to be. Uh, right? We're going to have to figure out a, a schedule. So we might turn Rebecca loose on, on putting together a schedule of, all right, we're going to be in Crown Point on this day. We're going to be in Chinle on this day, or maybe we need two days in Chinle uh, since it's a little bit larger place, um, uh, you know, and, and go on down the, the line, right, to where even the people in all the little towns and little villages, uh, like many farms is right outside of uh, Chinle. Are, is everybody going to be able to get over to Chin Lee for vaccinations? I've got my doubts. We may have to have a special vaccination day in many farms, uh, right? And so, uh, and so we would we would be putting everybody uh, to work, right? Uh, we would uh, be saying, "All right, Tylen, talk to the dealerships in the area." and see if you can get us a vaccination van. <laughs> or we might need more than one, right? If you think about it, vaccinating all the children on the reservation, whew, that's going to be a big, big job. And then maybe think about not only doing a mobile van, like having little clinics or little areas where we're open all the time, as opposed to 
just going out there one time because what if they couldn't come for some reason? They were in town or something. So then they would miss out on the chance of, man, we could have went over there and we could have got them their shots. Well, that, that's a good point. We'd have to talk to the IHS and say, look, can we set up uh, a room in the IHS uh, for a couple of weeks where we'd have our vaccination clinic? Or would we have to do that at a local school? Are our personnel going to be able to stay there in town? Or are they going to have to, uh, are we going to have to uh, put up tents for them? I mean, uh, you know, there you could see there would be a lot of logistical problems with this. And it's not as easy in some ways as something like building a bridge where at the end you can look at it and say, hey, we built that bridge. You know, uh, you, you look over your shoulder, you say, hey, we vaccinated the children of the Navajo Nation. Well, they're not all standing there uh, happy and smiling or anything. Uh, so, so the, the lowest level, we've got to think of all those little details. And I can see already that me, Cheryl, can hardly wait to get her teeth into a project. <laughs> yes. Uh, right? Then, from that, we're going to think about what is that going to cost? Right? If you think about the cost uh, about hiring medical personnel, that's expensive stuff. Um, and that is a huge problem. I know, I know some people that work over at the IHS here in town, they have huge problems keeping people um, because they don't pay very much. Um, you can also have problems because you have bad bosses that run people off. Uh, 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 you know, so what is it? What is it going to cost? And then some people that come out to the reservation, they're all gun ho to work for the reservation, but it's so secluded, and they're like, oh, I don't know if this was the right decision for me. And then they end up moving somewhere else because they're so like secluded. Like I can't believe we have to drive in that over an hour to get to the near Sam's Club. Or there's a Sam's Club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, you're you're exactly right. We have uh, uh, just here at the school. We've had people leave. Uh, we had a guy uh, leave after two days because he couldn't take it. Uh, and that wasn't even the record that semester. The record was over in Chin Lee, a math teacher left after three hours. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, what is the lowest subdeliverable, right? In our on our vaccine project, we might say, "Yeah, we vaccinated the children of Crown Point." Okay, well, that kind of thing might be our lowest subdeliverable, um, right? Then we might say, "Well, you know what? We uh, vaccinated everybody, uh, all the children in the Eastern Agency, right?" Uh, or that might be a deliverable, right? So we start, even though I started at the bottom explaining this, we start at the top. First we think in terms of what is the project, right? And we make sure that we state that in a way that everybody understands, right? It can't be a thing of, I'm thinking it's one thing, and Rebecca's thinking of something else, and Tylen's thinking of something else, and then we start to do the project, and it turns out everybody has a different idea about what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, comes down to then, what are our deliverables? And from those deliverables, what are 
the uh, subdeliverables, right? What are the things that go together to make it, this is a deliverable that has been done. And then what are the lowest subdeliverables? Maybe our deliverables are divided into subdeliverables. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have our cost accounting and our work package. Uh, and um, a lot of times when we think about our work packages, uh, again, it goes with the complexity and the size of the project. Um, uh, you know, uh, a customer calls up and says, hey, I want you to build this little Dumaflachi. You've got to be able to take it down because we're going to put it up at conventions. Well, that's a pretty, uh, a fairly simple project. Uh, if it's, you know, something small, it all fits in one little case, right? But I've also worked conventions where, oh my God, you're there in three days building somebody's display because it is so damn complicated. All right, so when we've got that work breakdown structure, it helps us evaluate what is the cost going to be, what is the time needed for that, and what is the technical performance that we're uh, going to be able to uh, deliver with this project. Um, and cost, time, and performance are all three things that we want to be able to uh, give a great account of ourselves on when we do a project, right? It's, it's not an exciting time when you have to go to the boss and say, well, we're way over cost on this project or we are not going to finish on time, or our project is not going to perform like we expected. And if you have to say more than one of those, oh my god. Uh, all right, so that gives us uh, information that we can inform uh, 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 we can inform people about the project, right? So, for example, if uh, uh, Thailand is the project manager and the rest of you are like uh, uh, team leaders on the project, y'all are going to have different levels of, uh, of detail that you need to be covering to get the project done, um, right? The team leaders are going to be very much in the trenches looking at all those work packages, making sure they're getting done, um, uh, where uh, Thailand is going to be coming around and, and talking to you, well, what do you think? Are you on schedule? And then uh, Rebecca says, well, we really need uh, some help with this. Could you give us a little more time in the R&D lab? Or, um, uh, or, you know, could we get another person? We need somebody who's a specialist in this uh, to help us with this, uh, right? And when the project manager goes up to the project champion, Tyler's not going to be discussing with them the thing, same things that she was discussing with you. She's going to be saying, yeah, the project is, uh, is on track. Um, we had a little problem. Uh, we needed to get another person for uh, this part of the project, but we've, we've handled that. Everything's going well. Um, uh, you know, but then she's also going to be going uh, to the project champion and saying, um, uh, look, could you get so-and-so to help us out some more? They haven't really been very cooperative 
and we really need to uh, uh, need some more uh, support from their uh, department. Things, things of that nature. Um, all right, so the work breakdown structure also helps us develop the organization breakdown structure, right? I already kind of outlined on a very crude level part of the organization breakdown structure, that we would have Tylen as the project manager, each of you would be team leaders, right? Well, Judith might need a very large team. She's got uh, 10 people working under her, uh, where Michelle has five people that have a different technical expertise, um, uh, and then Rebecca has seven people, um, right? And each of the teams is working on different parts of the task, obviously, and we'll, uh, 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 you'll see uh, more how these parallel kind of activities work uh, uh, later on in the course. So how many, out of all the projects you've worked, how many, like what's the number of the most amount of people you've had working on a project? Like you said that you have the project manager and then these other, project specialist or, and then they had like, like you said, okay, if I had five people, Rebecca had seven, Judith had 10, that's like 22. The most people I've been responsible for at one time, it kind of depends on how you think of it. When I was stage managing for Walt Disney's World on Ice, theoretically, I had uh, some say over about 50 people uh, during pack in and pack out, right? And then when we ran the show, uh, uh, there would be like 30 actors and uh, about uh, uh, 18 to 20 people on the running crew. Um, uh, Probably, though, a better uh, one would be when I was uh, the site manager for uh, Texas A&M University at the Corpus Christi Army Depot. There we had 28 people that were full-time, uh, myself being one of them. Okay, and they were divided down into sub-teams, and a team could be anywhere from one person uh, <laughs> Uh, up to about uh, six or seven, um, right? And our teams would kind of, for certain projects, we would end up assigning more people to this one area. So sometimes you'd have 10 or 12 people working in this one area uh, temporarily, um, right? But. Uh, but all the diff a lot of the different departments at the uh, Army Depot, we would have at least one person working there that would be our liaison and they would coordinate uh, the kind of mini projects we'd be doing with those different. Um, and one thing I've discovered is when you're managing so many people, uh, on, uh, on Walt Disney's World on Ice, really we didn't have problems with people being absent because they were sick. Uh, in the theater, it's kind of like, suck it up, get to work, you bum. Uh, <laughs> there's no time to be sick. Uh, but when I was managing for Texas A&M, well, I'm managing people that are working the whole year round. Um, a lot of them were just kids, barely out of college. Um, and, uh, you know, it would always be a thing of, oh, uh, well, uh, I want to be off next uh, Tuesday. Or they'd even just call you up. Uh, I can't come into work today. You know, you got a big project. They're part of the big project that's going on. 
Now we got to scramble to find somebody who can cover them today. Uh, you got to keep track of their hours because we're charging the government for their hours. Um, and uh, these guys were so crazy, they'd even say, oh, well, I'll do leave without pay. Uh, man, you are really messing up my budget when you start doing stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, the organizational breakdown structure, it can be just really, uh, uh, really difficult, um, uh, particularly because a lot of times it has to be kind of fluid. Uh, you know, we've got to put some people over here for a while, uh, but we've got to keep these other things going over here, too. Uh, uh, maybe not full speed, but they've still got to keep going forward and, and the customer can't feel like we're neglecting them. Uh, so our work breakdown structure helps us plan, schedule, budget. Um, uh, one of my favorite people when we talk about project management is actually President Eisenhower. He used to say, the plan is nothing, but planning is everything. Uh, because when you're the project manager, it's not just, I make a plan and, oh boy, everything happens now. Oh no. <laughs> Every day there will be some parts of it that have to be looked at and revised and, and, uh, and uh, uh, things changed around. And, uh, because of uh, problems with people, uh, uh, problems with facilities, uh, other resources like equipment or materials. Have you uh, ever came into an incident where you have two of your people working on the project that were both very good at what they do, but they kept bumping heads? Like, no, I think we should do it this way because if we do it my way, We'll get done faster, but this other person's like, no, 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 no. We can do your shortcut way, but we're going to be missing step B, C, and D. And they just kept like bumping heads. They, have you ever come across something like that? Oh, absolutely. You you cannot manage without running into that situation. <laughs> um, I um, I have taken over in. Uh, uh, in shops or on projects where um, things are just in chaos, people are fighting everywhere. Um, and personally, I hate that. Some managers love it when people are fighting and there's a lot of conflict. I am not somebody who likes that. Um, so I usually will talk to everyone. I'll say, look, you don't have to like each other. I don't care about that. But we all have to get along. We all have to act civil. Um, uh, if for no other reason than we don't want to embarrass ourselves in front of the customers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I'll uh, uh, and when I have people like that that are bumping heads. Uh, it kind of depends. If if I can't get them to a place where they can play nicely with others, um, I'll see if I can move one of them to a different part of the project where their abilities will, will help with that. Um, um, uh, but yeah, sometimes that's very difficult. Sometimes you have people that are just so stubborn, so bullheaded, uh, you want to smack them, but you know that's not a good management <laughs> style. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so I always do everything I can to uh, uh, to resolve these conflicts without any bloodshed. Uh, well, all right, actually, I've never had bloodshed on any of my projects, except when someone actually wounded themselves. <laughs> um, 
and um, um, and not when they wounded each other. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's always a challenge. I love managing. I think it's 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 a great job. It's a great position to be in. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely times you go home at night and and that one in the morning wake up when you're thinking, all right, what the hell am I going to do about this? Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of challenges. So, uh, also our work breakdown structure helps us to, uh, understand our communication channels and how can we coordinate all our different uh, project elements. All right, so here is a uh, work breakdown structure uh, to make a, uh, a tablet, right? I think everyone here knows what a tablet is. It's uh, kind of halfway between a computer and a phone, uh, right? So, uh, so they, uh, from the level of it's a ch tablet, They've broken it down and they said, you know what, it's the hardware and, uh, is one aspect and the CPU or central processing unit is another aspect. And then off over here, we have more items, probably things like the documentation, right? You're going to have to have an owner's manual or technical manual of some kind. Um, and um, um, uh, you, might, you might have a small group over here that's working on software compatibility. Uh, right back in the day, you would have had to have, you would have had to have a, a division of hardware and software uh, because software wasn't as flexible as it is now. Now you can buy a program and pretty much put it on a PC, put it on a Mac, uh, use it on all kinds of things. Where, bef uh, where before, you even had it down to the uh, to the level of this software only works with this brand of computer. Well, Apple's kind of like that still. Like, aren't they? Like they run on a different operating system that only Apple uses? Like iPhone, for example. If you have an iPhone and you have an Android, the stuff you have on your iPhone, you can't get on your Android. Or the stuff you have on your Android, you can't get on your iPhone. You can, like, you can, but you need to go and purchase it through an Apple store. Oh. Um. Well, you're, uh, you're right. There still are some software differences. And some softwares will only work still with one brand. But uh, it's, uh, it's a lot better than it was. The first uh, computer I owned was actually an Atari 800XL. And, um, and when you bought a program, it had to be for the Atari 8-bit computers, right? It couldn't be for a Commodore 64 or an Apple computer, right? It had to be the uh, uh, Atari computers, right? Now, over time, uh, uh, that there are less strictures. Uh, Y'all have probably all heard of Java. Uh, Java is a software program that makes those differences a lot less. Uh, so that you can have, uh, say, the Microsoft Office suite and be able to run that on your uh, PC type computer or your Mac type computer where before you had to have uh, Office for Mac or Office for PC. So you're right, it's not perfect, 
there are still apps and other things that will only work on one uh, because they're suited to that computer architecture or whatever. Uh, all right, so, uh, so we have these three main divisions here, right? And uh, uh, let's just follow down the hardware. The hardware uh, divides up into the frame, the cameras, uh, the speakers and the antenna and then it has work packages under each of those to make those work uh, uh, right so the, so people working on uh, say the w uh, w the work package c1 that's going to be about uh, uh, one of the cameras or a special way of using one of the cameras, right? So they'll design in that part. Now, I don't know if you would really have four cameras on a, tab a tablet. I think it's possible because, uh, I mean, even my simple old iPhone has essentially two cameras on it now. Um, Right, one so you can take a picture over there, and one so you can take a picture of yourself at the same time. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, in some ways, I'm a bit of a Luddite. Uh, what is that? Luddites were against uh, uh, automation technology. And that's when automation technology wasn't really that automated. Um, it's like um, the word uh, sabotage comes from the French putting their wooden shoes in the machine to break it, uh, which were called sabo. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, right? Uh, I, of course, I grew up with a phone was something that a wire came out of the wall and connected the phone to a whole network, right? And to some extent, I really just want that same kind of service from my phone. Now, over time, I've been corrupted. Like now, I like to use the maps thing, uh, uh, right? But I've got a ton of uh, I've got a ton of different apps on my phone. I have no idea what they do or why they're even on there. And I'm oops, and I'm okay with that. Um, so um, and um, uh, you know and it, and. We're, we're all the same depending on what, what we're talking about, right? Like some people own a very fancy and expensive car and they have no idea what most of the stuff on it does, <laughs> right? They know how to work the stereo, they know how to drive it. That's kind of the end of the, uh, of the show for them, yeah. right? Where. Uh, I know a lot of engineers that buy cars that have all the bells and whistles and they know how to use every one. Uh, all right, so, we, uh, so at the very lowest level we have our work packages of little individual tasks that must be done. Over on the hardware side, it's little things of how we design each of these things. Over on the uh, uh, CPU side here, it's going to be more about how do we program so that we can use different aspects they're building on this side, right? So this, they're defining it as these are the lowest levels of manageable sub-deliverable. Uh, right, so when it's time, we turn our guys loose on the frame and we say, all right, get in there, do it. 
right? We put Rebecca in charge of that. She's got some engineers and a whip uh, and uh, does her thing. Uh, right, but you can see a lot of the stuff here, uh, they've just kind of left at a major uh, point, right? They're not going down to the tasks for the battery. They're not going down to the tasks for the charger, the USB slots, the internet, um, right? But those are also going to have similar uh, sub-deliverable uh, uh, sub deliverables and uh, individual tasks. So, um, okay, well I see that I have pretty much used up um, our time. Uh, okay, so uh, let me Escape. Now, uh, homework number two, did I assign exercises two, one, two, three, and two, four? Yes. Okay. 2.1, 2 2.3, and 2.4. For, uh, Homework number three, I think it was Tuesday. Um, yeah, let's, um, hmm, damn, we're a bit behind. Um, let's do exercise 2.7. And um, chapter three, review questions. Um, 3.1 and uh, 3.4. All right, that will be due September 1st. All right, and if you forget, uh, I will uh, uh, post this uh, in Moodle. Um, are there any questions? No. Okay. Um, The, um, uh, when my classes are all in person, I always have the quiz at the second class of the week, and like the first 10 minutes will be for the quiz. Uh, I am going to shift to posting the quiz on, uh, on Moodle, and you'll be able to take it any time on Thursday um, and then just uh, email it to me um, and uh, that will let us um, uh, uh, have more exciting fun in the actual class okay yes I'm sorry Oh, okay. I thought Tyler was about to ask a question. How much do is do until tomorrow, right? Midnight. Tonight? Did I assign it last uh, Tuesday? You assigned it last Wednesday. Okay, so it's always one week after Thursday. it was assigned. I think it's on Thursday. So always one email. week after it was assigned. Okay. Then we can just email it to you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I um, had some people who were freaking out about handing back homework uh, or, uh, well, not so much handing it in. 
apparently they don't care if I get COVID. Uh, 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 but, uh, uh, but yeah, we'll do, uh, uh, we'll do handing it in and then, uh, I will, uh, 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 I'll go ahead and grade it and, uh, some things that I want to give you feedback on. So I will, uh, go ahead and, uh, 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 go ahead and scan it and uh, send it to you. So you want us to hand in our homework or email our homework? If you want to hand it in, you can go wild and hand it in. Okay. Uh, but if you feel more comfortable keeping everything at a distance. All right, so we will pick up next time with uh, 414. Slide 414. It's an exciting slide. Four, figure four, four, four. Four, four. Right, but the slide you'll notice oh, is 413. Oh, okay. okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, and thank you, you long distance uh, guys. Okay. Oh, yeah.